The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. So we finally come to the catacombs in our study of Ravel's orchestration of Mussorgsky's Pictures at an Exhibition. I feel that in this part, Mussorgsky is not only attempting to capture the majesty and tragedy and creepiness of the catacombs, such as they were painted by Hartmann when he visited Paris. In fact, Hartmann went on a journey in which he went across Europe painting, as any great young painter should do. <laughs> and obviously we can see that he was fascinated by the emotional landscapes of certain images, not just <laughs> the fine details or the realistic details. The particular painting upon which this music is based is actually of Hartmann himself on some kind of tour of the catacombs that are beneath Paris. And here in the music, I feel that it's not just Mussorgsky trying to be creepy, <laughs> trying to be spooky, trying to be horrifying, which he was very good at. He had a taste for the macabre which I feel far outstripped anybody else in The Mighty Five and Tchaikovsky. Russian composers who followed him, especially in the 20th century, really respected that quality about his scoring. And you see some of that in Shostakovich, not only in some of his symphonic writing, but also in his own orchestration of the Mussorgsky Songs and Dances of Death, but this kind of goes back to the core of where Mussorgsky was coming from in being a writer of spooky things. So if you just look at the beginning, it is a bunch of chords, really, with a little bit of melody thrown in, identifiable melody. Uh, to an extent, any group of chords implies a melody by either just the top note of the chords that are going by, or internal motion. You'll see here that all of these chords, remember this is in bass clef in the right hand, all of these chords have a high F sharp, right, in a row for these eight bars. So really it's the internal motion that the listener will focus on. B to A sharp, back to B, C sharp, D and then back to B and then ending with the C sharp or also the motion of the bass line. Things that move will be picked out. It's sort of like a frog's eye. They've done studies on the brain patterns of frogs as they look at things and apparently what happens when a frog is just sort of staring at a motionless landscape, after a while the frog stops paying attention to anything that's not moving. So it's almost as if it's just a white canvas with nothing on it, and the only thing that the frog is really looking at is just the tiniest motion of anything that it could possibly eat. So that really helps the frog to be able to identify something that it can lash out with its tongue and grab, right? So our acquisitive ears are very much the same when we are faced with something like this. Certain tones that continue on, they aren't really ignored, but they just become part of a background that doesn't get as much attention as the motion inside, right? So that is part of the whole quandary facing composers when they're writing music that is almost purely homophonic. In other words, basically just being mostly a bunch of chords, right? Well, this isn't purely homophonic. It's got some little bits of line inside the chords, but it still is, you know, 
it's about as homophonic as you could get and not be just a straight run of chords. I see within this page the yearnings towards orchestral arrangement, right? If you look at the dynamics, that really gives it all away, doesn't it? Because piano, crescendo, fortissimo. Mussorgsky could just as well have written forte here and then fortissimo or mezzo forte. And that would have been more of a realistic marking. Right? Because you can't really crescendo from a struck note in piano. You can't vibrato on it either, right? So it just is a case where you hit the note and then that is what you get until you hit the next note. And if you have these very long fermata tones, it doesn't really make sense to write crescendo and diminuendo. You're better off putting those markings over a longer run of chords or just marking each individual bar with the dynamic that you intend. Of course, this does work fine, right? But piano diminuendo doesn't really make any sense, does it? You have fortissimo sforzando, piano diminuendo. How are you diminuendoing into anything else? But if you flip that on its head and look at these markings as a work that could potentially be orchestrated, then they make perfect sense. So... I am just wondering whether or not Mussorgsky's plan all along was to orchestrate this suite of piano pieces. They work great as piano pieces, by the way. And of course, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this series of lectures, this suite is just a very common thing to play in the Russian concert music culture. Whereas in the West, it was almost completely unknown in its piano form, even after the orchestral arrangement by Ravel became famous. See here, poco a poco crescendo, that makes more sense as a crescendo marking because you can actually go somewhere. And then diminuendo across two bars, which don't really have much of a change except for just C natural to B flat, right? So you're already tailing off here, but then fortissimo, boom, crash, right? So I feel in all that the dynamics make more sense for instruments that have the ability to flex dynamically after playing a tone, right? So pretty much everything out there in the orchestra except for percussion instruments and harp. For instance here, okay. Fortissimo sforzando to piano under a fermata. So all this means really is just to hold on to this chord long enough to the point where this becomes a piano dynamic, right? Whereas if you let this fermata go by too quickly, when you let go here, it might still sound mezzo forte to the ear. We have been listening in our examples, our piano examples, to a really fine piano player who has donated some of her recordings to IMSLP Chiara Bertolio, and she is just a really great piano player. I really admire what she's doing with her music and her insight, and I always come back to the way that she phrases things and some of her artistic choices. And one of the cool things that she does here is here at the Ataka, going from this clearly delineated ending right straight into the next half of the movement. She chooses just to let the fermata and the held chord wash over in pedal, right straight into this high tremolo in the right hand. I think that's really a cool idea. I have not heard that from other pianists. Let's have a listen to that very fine pianist playing the first page of this movement, and then we'll take a look at Ravel's orchestration.
Here in the Ravel orchestration, you immediately see <laughs> how all of those crescendos and diminuendos can be put to good use immediately, right? Well, before we jump into that, let us take a look at the orchestral numbers that are going to be used. Two clarinets in A, <clears throat> bass clarinet in A, that is somewhat of a mythical beast. Models did exist, but probably weren't used all that often. And so the bass clarinetist would just play the part on their B-flat instrument. Two bassoons, contrabassoon, four horns in F, three trumpets in C, then the full range of lower heavy brass, three trombones, and tuba. Tam-tam is our sole percussion instrument. And then finally, the double basses. Now this is almost purely a brass chorale. However, Ravel makes use of support from the lower winds and from the double basses to connect passages from below. And you'll see how he does that in ingenious, crafty ways. What's really important for the listener whether you are paying any attention to all of these little notes that I'm telling you in between listenings, is to perceive the quality of the brass instruments that are being played. You can look at a passage like this and say, wow, beefy brass playing right there, and then just move on and not pay any attention to the qualities between the two groups of instruments. When you think about it, just look at who is playing what, where, and for how long. We start off with the lower heavy brass, first trombone, third trombone, and tuba, right? And this settles down from a B to a G, right? Same thing here, that is tenor clef, so that's a B, down a third to G. Now, if we look at the horns, we notice that they're playing exactly the same notes. They are dovetailing into this, right? They are not able to play this extremely low G down here, but that is taken up by the double basses. Dovetailing into there, along with the contrabassoon. So the contrabassoon and the double basses take the place of the tuba there in providing a very soft, manageable bottom register to the horns who are playing octaves here, right? Now, the first and second horns leap up an octave, and this middle horn here, the third horn, basically takes a break because their note is redundant because of the second horn being placed right there. This bottom note here is swapped between contrabassoon and a2 bassoons, who push at this as they are doubling the double basses here, and then drop down to a D at fortissimo. Then, if you look at this gap in here, where the horns and the winds and strings take a break, it's filled in by the lower heavy brass again. So, that is the strategy. Horns supported by bassoon, trading off with trombones and tuba, just back and forth, and they don't actually all play together until you get to this eighth bar here. A mighty fierce chord. Kind of interesting, isn't it, that we have this drop-off and then a subito fortissimo right on this fermata. I love the way the trombones come in sneakily here under the tail end of the horns. Pretty much dovetailing into the pitches that the horns are playing. Written C-sharp octaves sounding F-sharp down a fifth. So you've got your lower F-sharp here, and then your higher F-sharp here in tenor clef, and then this D is the same as that A right there, and so on. And then right here, you've got a low written E, which sounds concert A, but it's not this A, it's the A an octave higher. It doesn't really matter because the low sound there is just going to be swallowed into the texture because of this low B flat, right? We've already got that 
at an octave here, right? So the ear just thinks that it hears the continuation of the octave in the tuba, just because the tuba produces the overtone, right? Ravel could have put in bassoon and double bass to just get that octave in there, but it's really not needed at all. Then this is really lovely. Stopped horns above the triple P lower heavy brass. Such a cool ending chord right there. And of course, low F sharp on the bottom there, pianissimo in the double basses helps to stabilize the tail end of this and to carry on under the horns. So let's have a listen to all of that. It's kind of nice that there are shorter pages even though this ends up being longer because of the slower tempo, right? So listen for all of those things. Really use your ear here to see how Ravel dovetails between the two different groups that he has chosen here. The lower heavy brass trading off between horns assisted by bassoon family instruments and the double basses here and there. Then we'll take a look at the next part of this movement. From Rehearsal Mark 73, Ravel takes a slightly different approach. He's still limiting himself mostly just to lower heavy brass, horns, and bassoon family instruments with this one little pedal tone here in the double basses. But he's choosing to have them either play together or just have the horns play by themselves. Starting off here, it's kind of the most thematically chilling part of this entire movement. Basically just a G major third, contrasted by a G minor third. And I love the starkness of that. Sometimes when you boil down music to its simplest possible constituents, you can get a very creepy effect or a very unsettling effect because the ear really wants to hear some sort of texture, some sort of depth, and instead it's forced to listen to something that is extremely blatant and simple. That's sort of like the big um, Brahms effect of Hans Zimmer just having striped trombones play one enormous low note. It's that kind of an effect. then of course everything just leaps up an octave, for the lower heavy brass anyways. For the horns, it's more of an expansion. And I love how effective this little B-flat sixth is for the bassoons. Thrown into the center of everything, right? It locks into position right here, B-flat up to G, in between the third trombone and the tuba. And essentially, it's being doubled by the lower horns here. This D sounding G and this F sounding B flat. All right. When things get softer, you'll notice that the bassoons add more color to the sound. It has a kind of a moderating effect, something that you don't always want to add because it can get to be sort of blah after a while. People enjoy experimenting with color and saying, oh, well, if you add a bassoon to the horn, then you get this really extraordinary color. But what you really get is a somewhat moderating color, right? So if you do that all the time, then it gets to be sort of humdrum sounding. But from time to time, it helps to keep things homogeneous so that 
for instance, when you want to bridge between two parts, it keeps the timbre somewhat stabilized. That's my perception of why Ravel added this here. Now we're going to just a simple low A on contrabassoon and clarinets providing this middle voice in here, which is just lovely. That is actually providing an octave below the second horn here, right? G sharp being C sharp, and written low E in A clarinet being C sharp, an octave below that, right? Notice how Ravel balances this piano with A2 clarinets, providing some middle voices to the harmonization here in the horns, and that also works beautifully. It's like a little substitute horn. Also interesting how this low F sharp and first bassoon goes up a third to A, and that A is dovetailed over by this low written E, which sounds concert A on this same pitch, leaving the fourth horn to provide an octave above this low pedal tone here in the contrabassoon, with the double basses coming in to firm up the contrabassoon, which is probably starting to run a little bit out of air by the time you get to this big crescendo here especially at that very slow speed. And over all of this, we hear the first trumpet player playing a solo. I love the way that the Thai Philharmonic trumpet player adds a little bit of vibrato to that, something that you don't really hear that much in concert playing. But if done very subtly and very sweetly, it can add a beautiful expressive quality to the music that I don't feel is sacrilege at all. Taken all in all, though, this is a really wonderful surge of color and dynamic strength going right up to this point, which would be a perceived forte or perhaps poco forte, not really a hugely committed forte, something that can easily relinquish back down to piano for the whole group. Let's have a listen to that too. This really is of a piece with the following screen, but let's go back and forth between the written music and the musical examples, since this is such a slow movement. Looking at this last page of the first half of the movement, let's really break down the basics of texture. Here we've got all the brass playing at once. Then from the third bar here, after 74, the horns take over, supported by bassoons and double bass make it all the way here, and then dovetail into this massive heavy brass chorale here. Then everything settles down into this pianissimo, right? So we've got all the brass, just the horns, just the heavy brass, plus some assistance here and there. Now let's break it down a little bit octaves in contrabassoon and a2 bassoons above that. Same exact notes that are being played by the third trombone and tuba, and an octave higher, of which we've got this massive a4 unison on a sounding G below middle C, which is the same note as this in first trombone. Notice that Ravel doesn't ask for there to be a2 trombones here. He just asks for the first trombone, 
fortissimo. So it's really five brass instruments on a single pitch there with the first trombone probably adding a very scorching tone to the uh, four horns, right? Then that's contrasted by a leap up with this massive E flat major 6 4 chord right at the very top, which I feel gives this beautiful, brilliant sound. Once again, we are seeing Ravel's craft just spring out all over the place. Here we've got a different voicing of that E flat major chord down an octave, really. This would be a 6 3 chord voicing, right? So the median on the outside, then the fifth up a third from the bottom note, and then the tonic on the next step up. Now that exact same voicing is being played by the lower heavy brass, right? So it's horns plus lower heavy brass, and then on top of them, just that in the next possible harmonic positions, we have three trumpets. And that is just the most glorious sound really pay attention to how that sounds because that is a possible solution that you could use in your own scoring. Then that is contrasted by the lower heavy brass jumping down and then the trumpets basically adding to the top two horns, right? So this written D and B natural are the same as this E natural and G in the trumpets right there. Notice how the third trumpet gets a break here, right? Ravel just allows players that aren't being used to take a break, rather than feeling like he has to compensate all the time and give them things to do. And that dies off down to P, but the horns continue on. And that is a lovely idea because what that allows for is for the horns to maintain their level in the mix, right? and to differentiate their timbral quality from the heavy brass. And here is where Ravel brings in first bassoon and double bass playing in unison, just providing that low pedal tone. And it really does sound like a pedal tone on an actual organ the way that it's scored in its tone quality and everything. And then we've got some four-part harmony here, just a realization of the piano part. And here we have something similar to what happened before with the horns dying down and then stomped on very heavily by the heavy brass here. Just smash right there, right on the heels of this diminuendo. Here is a place where Ravel allows those companions, more typically to the horns, to accompany the heavy brass. And this is kind of interesting, something you don't see very often, and that is a fourth placed in a very, very low position. See, so it does happen sometimes. And that is doubled by contrabassoon and bassoons. And you've got the same sort of quality happening there with this low F sharp, but the B isn't doubled by the heavy brass because that is completely unnecessary, especially with this B right in here being played by the second trumpet. It just picks up on the harmonic resonance of the other instruments for a second. So the B is implied there by the rest of the brass. And that dies away to this right here, stopped horns, taking over as the heavy brass relinquishes. And we have one little touch of tam-tam. I bet you thought it was going to be one big smashing note, right? No, it's just this one little boosh. Sur la touche, so sultasto on this low F sharp, while that B note right here is being taken over by bass clarinet in A, right, uh, sounding down a tenth, so that is the B that is right above this F sharp right there. Then an F natural on first clarinet, sounding D down a minor third, and so on. 
I'm not going to get into the harmony of this and break all that down, but just noticing where some of the pitches lie. And <laughs> this cool diminished chord here on stopped horns. <laughs> it's all really fun. Let's have a listen to that. So pay attention to all those things. Just a smashing quality here of trumpets on the top with all the horns and the lower heavy brass doubling each other and then the way that the horn quality maintains as the heavy brass die away underneath them and then how the horns die away with a little bit of help from this low pedal tone which really does sound like an organ pedal and have their diminuendo stomped on by all the heavy brass again with a little bit of help from our bassoons and double basses and just how that relinquishes down into this diminished chord carrying on after that. Let's have a listen to that now and then I'll join you for the next lecture in which we take a look at Con Mortuis in Lingua Mortua.